bloodless lamb of God was he Full atonement can it be Hallelujah What a Savior Lifted up was he to die It is finished was his cry now in heaven exalted high, hallelujah, what a Savior, hallelujah, what a Savior, spotless Lamb of God, for the glory of the Father. You were crucified, you were beaten and rejected, for my sake despised, now in heaven you are seated, risen Lamb of God. ransomed home to bring then anew his song will sing hallelujah what a savior hallelujah what a savior spotless lamb of god for the glory of the Father, you were crucified, you were beaten and rejected, for our sake despite, now in heaven you are seated, risen Lamb of God. Hello North Point, um, Sean here this morning just uh, coming to you on behalf of the elders and to preach God's word to you. You're probably meeting in your homes with your families or with your friends that you are in lockdown with. We pray that uh, God's hand be upon you and we send you love and greetings in these extraordinary times that we're facing. Truly these are unprecedented times uh, for the nations of the world, for our country, but we as those who serve Jesus have a real hope and we feel in this time, it's the finest hour for the church. So what we're going to be doing is continuing in the book of Mark. We really felt that as we've been going through this book, just some of the things that we're preaching are so, so pertinent for the times that we are facing. And so today I'm going to continue in the book of Mark. There's so much meaningful truth in here that we can apply in these unprecedented times. And it's truth that convicts us, encourages us, compels us, and stirs us to fix our eyes on Jesus for real hope. And as we have been going through the book of Mark, we really are reaching a turning point in the book, a watershed moment in Mark, which resounds with what we are facing now, a key, key moment in the time of the world as we face this COVID-19 pandemic. So let us pray as we open up God's word together and let's trust that it'll bring real transformation in our hearts. Let's pray. Father, we thank you um, for your word. We thank you that your word is full of your authority. We thank you that your word is enough. We thank you that it's absolutely necessary. We thank you that it's endured with the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. And we thank you that as we preach it and as we come under its authority, Lord, we have everything that we need, Lord, to be able to see you, to remember the hope that we have in you, and to remember the mandate that you've given us. We pray now, Lord, as we hear your word, that you'd open up our hearts, our minds, to receive it with joy and to put it into practice in our lives. We pray also that this word will be a lens through which we can see the world and to which we can respond to the world with the love and grace and the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. We pray now, Lord, for every person that is listening, Lord, in our homes or wherever, Lord, we pray now, Lord, that they would find a greater sense of encouragement 
and they would have a greater revelation of Jesus Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have your Bibles there with you in your homes, I want to encourage you to turn with me to Mark chapter 8. And we're going to read from verse 27. Last week, Shorty preached um, from the pre preceding verses of Jesus uh, healing the blind man. And we're going to continue in that. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me. Matthew chapter, oh, sorry, Mark chapter 8, verses 27. And it says this, And when, and Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And that is an amazing passage of scripture. And as we look in the world today, I think the questions that are posed by this passage of scripture are really, really important for us today in what we are facing. They are very, very important questions as they were important for the disciples and for the people when Jesus was here in physical form on the earth. They are just as important for us today here in the year 2020 uh, facing the COVID-19 pandemic. And the questions that they are posed, the answers to them are so important because they have eternal ramifications and they are applicable in every generation, I believe. And here are the questions that I'm going to talk about today, which I believe we need to have the right answers to that will give us a real hope. Three questions today. First one, who do you say Jesus is? Second question, what did Jesus do? And third question, what must I do? To follow him. So those three questions and the answers to them are really, really important. In a time where God is shutting down all of the things that we've put our hope in, now is the time in which we need to answer these questions that will determine where we spend eternity and what real hope do we have. Who do you say Jesus is? What did Jesus do? And what must I do to follow him? Now we've seen in the preceding verses, Jesus healing a blind man in two parts. And this gives us hints that it is possible to have a partial revelation or a partial understanding of who Jesus is. But I want to commit to you today, we need to see Jesus clearly. We need to trust that we have a bigger, growing revelation of who Jesus Christ is. And that is what we've been seeing through the book of Mark. As we've been going through, here, through the book of Mark, we've been seeing there's a bigger and bigger and bigger revelation and picture of who Jesus Christ is until we come to the culmination today. And so Jesus asked this question to his disciples. He says, he said to them, who do people say that I am? And their response was that perhaps these one of the prophets like uh, Elijah or, or one of the people that were seen in Israel's history as prophets that, were, that came from God, that spoke the word of God to them. And I believe the question is as pertinent today that we can pose to us today, who do the people around us today, North Point, say that Jesus is? Do they say like he is a prophet like the people of Israel? Do they say that he's a revolutionary teacher? Because as we look at his teachings, they're revolutionary. I mean, whoever taught us to love our enemies, whoever taught us, uh, taught us to, to come to the one 
who, and love our enemies and forgive the people, forgive those around us to treat people in the same way that we want to be treated. These were amazing teachings. But is that all that Jesus was? Was he, is, was he just the greatest man who ever lived? And I have people in my life who believe that. Was he purely just a miracle worker? Was he a savior in the sense that he gives us a ticket to heaven to be saved? You know, um, was he just a doer of good works? Was he a man of love and compassion and mercy for the poor and the outcast? Who do people say Jesus is? And amazingly so, a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I watched a series on Netflix called Messiah. And there is, I believe, a picture of what the world thinks Jesus is today. It was a picture of a man who was in the Middle Eastern uh, area and who was able to be amongst different groups of people and perform miracles and, and save people as the one who had come from God. But is he the same Jesus that we see in the Bible? And I would contend to say no, because the reality today is that everybody has a view of who they think Jesus is. The question is, is that the same Jesus that we see in the Bible who has revealed himself to us? So my question to you today, North Point, and to everyone who's listening is, who do you say Jesus is? Because Jesus, after asking his disciples who the people say he is, he turned that question to them and asked them, who do you say that I am? And so the question I'm posing to you and to myself is, who do you say Jesus is? And I want to say this, Jesus is far more than we think he is. You know, here Peter had a revelation that Jesus is the Messiah or the Savior, the one, the long-awaited Savior Israel had been waiting for and for what all the nations in the world longed for and desperately needed. And it's amazing because the book of Mark shows us this progressive revelation of Jesus that unfolds and gets bigger and bigger until this watershed moment. And if you begin to remember with me as we've been going through the book of Mark, it starts off by saying that this book is about Jesus, the Son of God. It shows his approval by the Father. It shows his ministry and perfect life. It shows him as a great teacher and a prophet. It shows that he has power over sickness and over death, over evil spirits and even over nature. It shows that he has the power and the authority to forgive sins, which only God can do. So here we have a picture of someone who is far more than just a good moral teacher, who is far greater than just a prophet or a miracle worker. This is the eternal Son of God who has come to earth in person. This is God in the flesh. This is God the Son, truly God, truly man. A mystery which we will never be able to comprehend with our finite and limited minds. What's amazing is if we look at the parallel accounts in the other Gospels, specifically Matthew, Matthew's account says that Peter says that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that this revelation has been given to him by our Father in heaven and not by men. And so we need God to open up our minds and our eyes to see Jesus in this way. We cannot do it by ourselves because our minds are limited we have a very limited view of who Jesus is. But Matthew mentions that this is a revelation on which Jesus will build his church and on which the gate of hell can never prevail against it. And so if we look at this picture of Jesus, we see he is far, far greater than we can begin to imagine or understand. We see that he is truly the Son of God. We see that he is truly God and truly man that he has come from the Father, full of grace and truth, and he has come to earth with a particular mission from God. He is not just a mere man. He is not just a prophet because only God can forgive sins. Only God has authority over nature to calm the storms. And even the disciples previously said, who is this man that even the storms and the winds obey him? So I want to say to you, whatever your view of Jesus is, he is far bigger than what it is right now. And more so, Matthew says that on this revelation of who Jesus is as the Messiah, he will build his church and that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And how we need to hear that, how we need to understand and have this revelation of Jesus Christ because we need not fear in this time 
because Jesus is building his church. Even in the midst of chaos and of lockdown and of fear and of anxiety, the church of Jesus Christ is being built by Jesus himself and nothing can stop it. Nothing can stop the kingdom of God coming through the church today. And I pray that you would find hope and encouragement in that. So what do you understand about Jesus is really important. But also what you understand about the work of Jesus Christ is also very important. You see, He is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. There's a recognition that we need to have of this. And you could know that in your head of who He is, but you can also have a wrong view of what His uh, Messiahship should be like, what His view of, or what your view of His work on earth was like. And this is what Mark seems to hone in on here now, that Jesus' role is not just to heal people or to set up an earthly kingdom or to give us what we want, but His role on earth was to save people from their sins through His death and resurrection. And this is at the heart of Jesus as Messiah, and this is at the heart of the gospel that we are called to share and to respond to. And so Jesus, after um, recognizing this revelation that Peter had that he was the Christ, the Savior, the one who would come to save his people from their sins. Afterwards, it says Jesus gives a prediction of his death and resurrection. And so he wants to say on this revelation, now also remember not just who I am, but what it is that I've come to do. What is my work? And his work uh, revolved around his life, his death and his resurrection. And so and so Jesus had to teach his disciples about his death and resurrection because they didn't know it. And so we too need to be taught on this. And this is what we need to learn. So let's learn what Jesus did. What did he actually do? Because we can have an idea of who he is in our minds, but we can totally not know what his work on earth was when he came in his first coming to earth. And so the next question is, not only do we need to know who Jesus is, we need to also understand what did Jesus do when he came to earth? So the question I'd ask you is, what is your response to what Jesus did in his death and resurrection? You see, Peter, when Jesus predicted this and Jesus was teaching them on this, Peter's response was to rebuke Jesus. Was to tell, tell Jesus, no, this cannot happen to you. After all, who wants a Messiah or a Savior who is going to suffer? and be rejected and die. That's not a deliverer. That's not a conqueror. That's not the hero that we're looking for. That's not the savior that we want. We want a savior that is accepted, that is celebrated, and that shows us his power to rule over people. And surely this picture of what Jesus is painting, that sounds weak. That's not, that doesn't sound like a savior who comes to deliver us. You see, friends, this is why we need God to give us a revelation of who Jesus is and what he had come to do. You see what, when we look at things this way, this is a, such a man-centered view. It's based on what we want. It's based on our desires. It's based on our view on what we believe God should do for us. It is us looking upward to God. Yet we fail to see that this is God's divine, sovereign plan to save us from our sins. You see, our greatest need was not for a new human leader. Our greatest need is for a savior for our sins. And this is the way that God would, in his wisdom and in his divine plan, uphold his justice and righteousness, yet at the same time extend love and grace and mercy to sinners who have rejected him. You see, no man could have thought of this plan to save his people from their sins. Certainly Satan wouldn't have known this. He would have thought this would have led to the downfall of Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah. But no, this was God's divine, all-wise, just and loving way to save us. What looked like weakness was the most powerful and loving demonstration of God's victory over sin and death. And the death of Jesus as a perfect sacrifice to atone for your and my sin and to rise again from the dead was glorious. It was and is glorious because in this God is glorified in saving people and dealing with their greatest need. 
You see, at the cross, we find forgiveness. We find the perfect sacrifice for sin in our place, a sacrifice that we could never bear. We find a Savior who bears the punishment in our place. We find mercy, we find grace, we find redemption from sin, and we find reconciliation from, uh, to God. And at the same time, we also see God's justice and, and His righteousness demonstrated to us. In the one moment in which God was bringing judgment for the world's sin on His Son was the very same moment that God was extending love and grace and mercy for all who would believe in His Son who died on the cross for their sins. Isn't that amazing? No human person could come up with this. No one could have engineered this in their minds in all of their earthly wisdom. Only God could come up with this plan to save us. And in the resurrection, we see a Savior who rises in power as the Son of God with victory over the sin that enslaves us, over death, which is our greatest fear, and over Satan. We see that we too can have the hope of eternal life because of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And so we need not fear death because we have the hope to be with God forever in a new heaven and a new earth to come. That is glorious. That is full of hope. That will help us to deal with our fear now. No matter what is happening around us, we have a glorious, secure, eternal hope in God that one day we will be with Him forever. No matter what happens now, we need to look there. We need to look towards the hope that Jesus secures for us so that we can live today with a real joy, with a real hope because of what Jesus Christ has done. And so I want to ask you and I want to compel you by the Holy Spirit, I pray that He would show you to see this, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ from God's point of view and not just purely from your point of view. And it's amazing. In the same way as seeing the work of Jesus Christ in a man-centered way, today people are looking at this pandemic of COVID-19 in a limited man-centered way. And I want to say this, friends, it breeds fear, it breeds hopelessness, it breeds anxiety. People are saying, in their hopelessness, people are saying, what kind of a God allows this pandemic where people are dying, where countries are in panic, where many people are affected, where economies are shutting down, where education has been stopped, where everything that you can think of in your daily life has been impacted. But again, I would say this is a man-centered way of looking at it. God's sovereign plan in this could be beyond our understanding. But we need to rest assured that He is in control, that He is working this for His glory and for our good. He could be permitting this for the greatest harvest of salvation that we've ever known. He could be opening up people's hearts to the gospel as they are crying out to God in desperation. It's in these moments that God has our attention. And if you'd seen the speech by the Italian president where they felt over this time they'd lost everything, all hope, all of their solutions, everything they've tried has not led to the stop of this pandemic. That, my friends, is a picture of God getting our attention. That ultimately we need only Him. Only He is acting in this time to save, to heal, to bring a true hope. God has got our attention. What can be shaken has been shaken. People's hopes have been dashed. Now is the time that God is drawing people to put their hope in Jesus Christ. This, I believe, is one of the finest hours in our generation for the church. So I want to compel you by the Holy Spirit. Let us be bold. Let us be loving. Let us look for every opportunity to share this gospel. Let us call on people to turn from their sin and put their trust in Jesus Christ. Let us call on them or call on them to look to Christ, the one who's sovereign over disease, the one who's sovereign over sin and is able to save us, the one who's sovereign over all of the calamities that this world can face. And he is perfectly in control. And what the enemy and what people would look to use for evil, he is able to use it for good, for our ultimate good and for his glory. You see, this Jesus who came to earth at first came to save us and to extend grace. That's why 
it is said of it in the scriptures, now is the time of salvation between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. Now is the time of salvation. Now is the time when grace is extended to us. And now he has come, he has lived the perfect life on our behalf. He's died the death that we deserved in our place for our sins. He has risen again from the dead, showing that God was satisfied with his sacrifice for our sins and showing that we truly should take everything that he said seriously. And now he has ascended to heaven and poured out the Holy Spirit over the church to continue his mission here on earth. He is now in heaven interceding for us. But I want to say this, he is coming back again. And when he comes back, it will not be to save us. He is coming back to judge us eternally. This is the time for people to respond to Jesus. It will be too late when he comes back. That dispensation would be over for us to respond to his grace. And when he comes back, he will judge us either to be with him forever in the new heaven and the new earth or to face eternal judgment away from him in hell. My question to you, based on what Jesus has done, what would be your response? My prayer is that your response would be to turn from your sin and put your trust in Jesus Christ. Trust in Him to save you. Trust in Him to sustain you day by day and that you would recognize that all of your best efforts to save yourself, to make yourself with, right with God is meaningless. But God in His wisdom sent His one and only Son who was a perfect representative from Him who's God in the flesh. He lived a perfect life on your behalf and He purchased your obedience you and me, we could never meet up to God's requirements in the law. But Jesus perfectly obeyed it for you on your and my behalf. And also he took the punishment that we deserved on the cross for our sins. He bore it on the cross. He was a curse for us. And he offers us the great exchange. Our sin for his righteousness. He offers us forgiveness and reconciliation and redemption from sin. And I want to say, would you turn from your sin and would you, by God's mercy, respond to Jesus and run to him? Come to him, put your trust in him. Turn from your sin and know that he is a, a loving, a gracious, a merciful Savior who will call you to himself and will set you free from your sin, save you and give you the hope of eternal life with him forever. So the third question that I want to ask in this time, as we've asked already, who do you say Jesus is? What did Jesus do? And now the question is, what must I do to follow him? This is one of discipleship. One of what authentic discipleship looks like. What, what does an authentic follower of Jesus look like? It's all good that we might know that he is the truly God, truly man, our Savior and Messiah, the only means by which we can be saved and then we can understand his life and his death and resurrection as significant to save us. But the reality is that we might not respond to that. And so Jesus answered that question in, in verses 34 to 38. And calling, he says, to the crowd, to him and with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let them deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And these words haunt me as a follower of Jesus Christ. And I pray that they would be piercing to your heart and to your soul. Jesus says, if you, in knowing this, your response is to deny yourself, take up your cross and to follow him. And in these words we see self-denial means letting go of our self-determination of what we can do to save ourselves and replacing it with an obedience to and a dependence on Jesus as our Messiah and Savior. Here is the true call to discipleship. is to deny ourselves and see our desperate need of Jesus and to come and to lay everything down and to follow Him as our greatest treasure, to obey Him and to do it joyfully. The cost of discipleship includes being able to follow Jesus and to confess Him courageously and boldly in a time where others would renounce Him and to stay true to that in every day of our lives. And so I would say to you, 
Jesus' word. For whoever would save his life would lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel would save it. In these moments, we as Christians are called to hold out this message. It's not a time for self-preservation. Yes, we are in lockdown. Yes, we might not be able to see f- people physically, but I want to encourage you, Christian, confessed Christ follower, now is the time to hold out this good news to people who have no hope. Now is the time to unashamedly proclaim the gospel and to tell people about who Jesus is and what he has done. Now is not the time to think about yourself only and what you can do and to go into self-containment and, and selfishness. Selfishness is against what Jesus is saying here as a disciple. There's a self-denial. Friends, I want to encourage you. Would you pray? Would you make every opportunity uh, or make use of every unique opportunity to share the gospel in this time with those who might be in lockdown with you, with your friends and family, through whatever means is possible? You know who they are. I want to say to you, God has got their attention in this time. Over this time, just in our circle of family, I've been able to share the gospel with friends, with family, that I've not been able to sit down with, I haven't seen for a very long time. But through WhatsApp, being able to share this message and to share with people that I'm praying for you, I want to co- compel you or, or tell you about Jesus. Put your trust in Him. He's your only hope. And I want to say every one of you in this time has that opportunity. Don't miss it. You know, the Holy Spirit is there. He enables us to be bold in this time. You need not try and do this um, just purely uh, for the sake of doing it, but you can be compelled by God's love. I want to pray that the Holy Spirit will help you to see this pandemic, people in this pandemic through God's eyes, through His perspective. They desperately need a Savior. And yes, pray for people. Pray for our governments. Pray for people that uh, have lost family members. Pray for those who need healing. I do believe that Jesus is able to heal. He is willing and able and He is sovereign over this. But pray more for people to put their trust in Jesus, that they would be saved. They could be healed in this time. But what does their eternity look like? And I want to say, share the gospel. You would be amazed, again, how Romans 1.16 is in our hearts. This is the power of God unto salvation that God would use through the foolishness of preaching the gospel, a means to save people, will show you that this power is not reliant on you, but it's on God who infuses this message with His power, And people will no longer uh, rely on man's wisdom, but on God's power in this time as you share the gospel. So I would encourage you to do this. So yes, in the midst of all of the things that I've said, here's the application for us today. And here's what I'm praying for. I'm praying for you that you would have a greater revelation of Jesus today by the Holy Spirit, wherever you might be, and that you would respond to Him today. I'm praying not only would you have a greater revelation of who He is, in his person, as the perfect Son of God, truly man and truly God, the second person of the Trinity, co-eternal, equal in authority with the Father and the Holy Spirit. But also you would see that he was truly man who came to this earth and he perfectly represents us to God and perfectly represented God to us. That your revelation of him will be far, far far greater, and that will cause you to respond in worship and to treasure Him even more. But I'm also praying for a greater revelation of the work of Jesus Christ in your life, of what He did in His life and in His death and in His resurrection. And I want to pray in this time also the third thing. Now is the time for you to be the disciple that Jesus requires of you and enables you to be by the Holy Spirit. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow Him, obey Him, Trust that by the Holy Spirit, you could become more like Him in word and in deed. And now, my friends, also the fourth thing, now is the time for you to share the good news of Jesus, of who He is and what He's done for you and for others now. You know, Jesus told them in this parable not to tell anyone, because I believe at that time, He had not yet died and rose again. His time had not yet come. But now we live on the other side of that. He has died, He has rose again, and He has ascended to heaven. And now we have the mandate from Jesus Himself in the Great Commission to freely and boldly share this gospel of who He is and what He has done. We are called 
to call people to turn from their sins and to believe in him. We are called now to train and to teach people to obey everything that Jesus has commanded. So I want to pray for that. So can we bow our heads in prayer? Father, I thank you for this word that brings life to us and hope to us, convicts us, it stirs us, it should also challenge us in this time of how we ought to live, Lord. In light of who you are, in light of what you have done, and in light of what you call us to do as we follow you. I pray with that revelation uh, ring true deep in our hearts. May it bring lasting transformation and change. May it lead to greater worship of you. May it lead to a greater obedience to you. May it lead to a greater hunger and thirst for you and for your word, Lord. And may it also lead to a greater passion, Lord, to the witness of who you are and what you have done to a dying world, to a hopeless world in this time. I pray for whoever is listening this morning, firstly, that do not know you. I pray in this time, Lord, if you are doing a work in their heart, that you are showing them their greatest need is to put their trust in you and to be saved, Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus now that their response would be to turn from their sins, put their trust in you and be saved with an eternal hope. Be forgiven of their sins, be redeemed, be reconciled to you and have that amazing testimony over their lives that they are now a child of God. I pray for salvation now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Pray for those who need healing, that you bring healing to them. Those who need hope, that you bring hope to them. Those that need encouragement, you'd encourage them in this time, Lord. And I pray in this time, Lord, we would live with joy and peace and assurance because of who you are and what you have done, Lord. And I pray that this would be true kingdom living for us in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, friends. I pray that this would have been a great encouragement to you as you've heard this in your homes, that this would continue to sustain you and that you would look to Jesus in this time. Before I end, I just want to share with you a few key notices for us as a church in this time as we are in the lockdown period. Um, firstly, I want to encourage you to please stay connected, check up on each other, pray for your brothers and sisters. Uh, let us know of those who are in need of prayer or of food or help who are vulnerable, again, I want to remind you, we are a community of God. We are the people that God calls together as family. Let us look out for one another. So pray, be in contact with your friends and fellow brothers and sisters here at North Point City Church. Then I want to encourage you to continue to, with your giving in tithes and offerings. Please look out for the banking details on our website, northpoint.org.za or sorry, npcc.org.za. Please go on. You'll find the banking details. We encourage you to continue giving so that we can continue doing the work that we need to do here at North Point City Church. We also want to ask for a special um, time now where you can give towards relief to the poor and needy. We'd encourage you to give to Impopomo, which is our ministry to the poor and needy. And we are trusting in this time that we can bring relief and, uh, and demonstrate mercy to many, many people in our city and beyond that are in need of food, of help. So please, we encourage you, the banking details for Impopoma are on the website as well. Please give generously to this so that we can make food and whatever else is available to people who are in desperate need. So continue in your giving. We need your generous giving in this time for tithes, offerings, and for giving to the poor and needy. Then please, Look out for the daily devotional that we're going to be sending out uh, every single day. Gather your families, your friends together, whoever is in lockdown with you, and start the day in prayer and in God's Word. Start it with a fresh hope, and as you're doing that, engage with us. Send pics of your um, family that is praying together, that, is, that maybe has questions. Put it on the comments, and we'll see how we can get to you. We can still stay connected through technology over this time. Um, and lastly, we want to stay um, at this stage, please obey the laws that have been put in place for your protection during this lockdown. Stay safe with your families and whoever's with you in your homes. Only go out for the necessary uh, things that you may need at the shops and let us do our part as responsible citizens to not spread this pandemic any further. May God bless you and we look forward to sharing with you again in the course of this week and then look out for our uh, a sermon again next Sunday which you can hear God's word. May God bless you and your families and everybody a part of North Point. We love you dearly and we are praying for you. Goodbye.